Hello, my friends. I want to share today with you two ideas. I think if you fully grasp these two ideas, then uh, we will be <laughs> eternally liberated from all seeking and also from all suffering. Uh, big tall promise, okay? So what I'm uh, suggesting is two insights that could lead to liberation from all suffering and also all seeking. All suffering and all seeking. That would be total freedom. Total freedom. So are you ready? Okay, so the first insight is the insight regarding language. So I have been a student of language all my life. In fact, that's how I make a living, by selling words. And I've been curious about the origins of language. So I read everything about um, the evolution of language. I've um, gone to all the AI, um, you know, chat GPTs and chat GPT-4s and Google Bards and Bing and all the AI platforms to look for sources on the origins of language. I've studied, uh, you know, people like uh, Marvin Minsky and others uh, who are linguists on the origins of language. And my worst one question has always been, did humans create language or is language a divine creation? Is language a divine creation? And uh, is even um, anything um, possible to experience without language? Is it possible for you and me to experience anything any perceptible or cognitive knowing without language? Does language shape perception, cognition, knowing, um, experience? Because without experience, uh, there's uh, no life as we know it. Life is a continuum of experiences. So who or what created language? And I assure you, if you do your research, you will not find a definitive answer. And yet we cannot explain anything, biology or evolution or existence or experience um, or perception or knowing without using language or a word. And we are familiar with the um, biblical saying, first there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was divine. So who created language? What created language? And um, is biology an experience that we can have only through language? Is the universe, galaxies, planets, stars, trees, insects, humans, animals, rodents, rocks, minerals. Is all this dependent on language? Because I've used words right now, minerals, rocks, trees, galaxies, stars, moon, sun, earth, sky, animals, human beings. All you have to do is use one word, and you conjure up a whole universe. So let me choose one word right now, arbitrarily. And the word is tree. So as soon as I say the word tree, I'm sure a picture appears in your awareness. And depending on the contraction or expansion of your awareness, uh, you will see infinite modes of meaning in that word tree. I've also wondered why all these enlightened beings, Buddha, etc. sat under a tree. 
Anyway, so tree. I think the word tree and on the screen of my consciousness, I experience a tree, trunk, leaves, branches, flowers, buds, fruits, seeds, right? But then I can expand my consciousness and look at that tree as a, uh, as a combination of earth and water and space and transformation, electromagnetic energies, particles, force fields, all kind of ephemeral entities, um, but appearing as that tree. But then I could go further, I could look at the tree from the point of view of a honeybee that uh, navigates experience through a waggle dance, a language that is totally alien to me, but a language. Honeybees use waggle dance to communicate where to go, to find honey, to which flavor, what grove, etc. And that is a universe unto itself, the universe of bees. But somehow that universe of bees is connected to the universe of birds, because birds come and feed on insects, and insects reproduce <laughs> through um, their own communication methods. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, there are insects that communicate <clears throat> through a language called dancing. But um, those bees are part of an ecosystem of birds. Birds come to eat those bees. And those birds themselves are navigating the experience through um, instruments that we don't normally use for navigation, ultraviolet. Um, experience um, bird navigates moves from one place to another of course the birds create their own nests and uh, the birds and the bees and the insects and the honey are part of a whole ecosystem of existence that ultimately involves the whole universe the earth the air the water the rain the sunshine the earth itself with all its uh, all its ecosystems of living forms the trees communicating with each other through fungal networks there's a whole universe in that word tree but of course i just use the word in english uh, what is the word in sanskrit or swahili or um, uh, or any of the Germanic languages, or uh, or um, Chinese. Um, see, um, there is a word for tree, but uh, it's a different sound, it's a different vibration, and it's linked to different facial gestures and expressions. Without language, to describe, there is no word to explore. But here's another very interesting thing. The word does not describe, it constructs an experience, it conceives an experience, it governs an experience, it becomes the experience. And first there was the word and was the word was with God. So I, uh, being uh, an Advaitist, this means I believe in non-dual monism as the source of all experience and language as the instrument for the source of all experience, not only in humans, in every species. Furthermore, go a little further, the human itself is an experience. The other species themselves are experiences. And we have to use language to actually infer those experiences or know those experiences. So, language is not human. In fact, nothing is human. They said, did humans create the Empire State Building? 
And the answer is uh, no. Uh, consciousness conceived the Empire State Building and used the instrument, this particular instrument, this particular mode of knowing Homo sapiens to create the Empire State Building. But what about um, a star? What about a galaxy? Is that not a word for a sensation, a combination of sensations, sounds, textures, tastes, smells, the alchemy of sensation? And you said, that's the moon, <laughs> that's a physical body, that's a star, that's a rock. And you can say it in any language, okay? And you will have an experience. But of course, the language, depending on the mode of instrumentation and the language that we use, it will create an experience. When I say we, I, even we is a product of language. So let's go a little deeper into this because in Indian philosophy, there are four levels of language, four levels of speech. So let me explain these to you. And this will, I hope, give you a major shift. So para is the highest form of sound. Sound is the basis of language or vibration, let's say. Even gestures are vibrations, facial expressions are vibrations. But let's take this sound. So para is the highest form of sound, which is unmanifest and transcendent. It is the source of all speech and the essence of the supreme reality. Para means beyond, transcendent. I would go further and say at this level, para, language or all languages are in superposition. All linguistic languages are in superposition. So the word tree in every language is in superposition for a particular experience, depending on your state of awareness. The word tree, it is in superposition with that word tree or whatever it means in every possible language, every possible language, linguistic. But it is more than that. It is the superposition of languages beyond linguistics, so biological language, which is his own ecosystem of experience, mathematical language, language of physics, quantum mechanics, the language of dance, the language of art, the language of music, all these languages coexist simultaneously and are entangled and in superposition for infinite experiences. Infinite experience. And they're not the creations of the human mind. The human mind itself is a word, an expression of language. Okay? So para, the infinite supreme source, whatever you want to call it, God, divine, unknown, formless, transcendent, irreducible, without cause, shapeless, formless, infinite, vibrationless, superposition of every model of reality. Because those models are created in language, mathematical, biological, physics, biology, chemistry, etc. The supreme language, unmanifest, para, that's what it means. The second level of language is Pashyanti. It's the sound vibration heard in the causal worlds. Causal worlds means worlds beyond the subtle worlds, where the sound and its meaning are inseparable. The sound echoes the sense. It is the first stage of manifestation of speech where intention and expression are one. Second level. So now what we're doing is at the second level, the divine infinite source of all languages is choosing one modality of experience. Let's say that modality of experience is biological language, or modality of experience is mathematical language, or modality of experience is linguistic. But Pashyanti is where infinite possibilities are reduced to an ecosystem 
of probabilities. Pashanti. The third level of expression of language is Madhyama. It is the sound as perceived in the subtle or pranic world. It is an intermediate stage between unmanifest and manifest speech where words take shape in the mind before being spoken. That's when you inter hear your internal dialogue, mostly linguistic, okay? Or it could be another model of language if you're used to thinking in biological language or mathematical language or any other form of language. But there's, you hear your own conversation with your own self, but there's no sound, okay? There's no sound. Okay, so it is between manifest and unmanifest. In fact, you can choose not to speak what you're thinking, right? So what is it that chooses not to speak out what you're thinking? What is it? Okay. And then the fourth level is, uh, we can say in Sanskrit, it's called Vekri. It's the lowest form of sound and it signifies outward expression. It is the speech that we use in verbal communication, which is differentiated by various languages and symbols. So language is the symbolic mode for manifestation. And we did not create it. Okay. It comes from the infinite source of all languages, all models of reality, which then give us maps of reality, which we explore as experience. Okay. So that's the first insight I wanted to share with you, that language conceives, governs, constructs, and becomes manifest reality. The second is a question of identity. As soon as you say, use a word, you create a provisional identity, tree, human being, watch, hand, book, um, phone, etc. So this word has now become the so-called flesh, the so-called material world, but as you can see, the word itself has infinite possibilities. I use the word tree and you expand its correlations and its relationships that ultimately appear as that tree. And there's a whole universe there. You know, I, you, can, I'm sure, relate to this poem from William Blake to see the world in a grain of sand um, um, and see you know, something, a wild flower in the palm of your hand, hold eternity in the palm of your hand, to see a world in a grain of sand and hold eternity in whatever, that experience. So it doesn't matter what the word is, if you chase it, you'll end up with the total universe. But then these are these four stages. And who or what is creating these stages, which leads me to the second insight, identity. The only identity that you and I have is contained in two sentences um, that I can relate to. So those two sentences I, I draw from the Bhagavad Gita right now, um, in chapter 13, I believe. I am the field and I am the knower of the field. So the field is consciousness and consciousness is existence. Existence, awareness are synonymous, okay? No awareness, no existence, no experience of existence. So I am is both the field of possibilities, infinite field of possibilities. I'm the knower of the field, the field is self-aware, and the field uses language to create experience, infinite experiences. And all these languages are 
in superposition till one is used to manifest an ecosystem of experiences or several are used but then only one ecosystem of experience is available at one time depending on the language that you're using and it goes through these four stages para unmanifest pashyanti a differentiated stream of experience being created madhyama the interval between the manifest and the unmanifest and vikri that particular stream of manifestation so the field knows itself as awareness but the field also experiences infinity of experiences through the production of infinite modes of knowing also coexisting as the superposition of language therefore language is the divine act of creation period and all we have to do is shift our identity from being a person which is a product of language to the field of awareness in which the person is but one continuum of experiences but one continuum of experiences a glimpse that the infinite is having at this moment called deepak or that painting or whatever word you wish to choose so words are the magical property of those who know how to create two insights language creates and you're not a person person is a product of language you are the field and the knower of the field just these two insights should bring all seeking and all suffering to an end i hope it made sense to you <laughs> maybe it did not but just you know relating this to you and communicating this to you brings me great joy and freedom <laughs>